health, psychology, and human nature with André Stureson. Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of Health, Psychology, and Human Nature with André Stureson a science-focused podcast where we explore, learn, and improve our lives together. How did we get our brain, and how is it different from other brains? Answers to that and a lot of other questions are given today by Associate Professor Susanna Herculana Hussel. We will also get into how many neurons we have, how many neurons we have in our cerebral cortex, how our brain compared to other brains, how we got our brain, and also how much energy our brain use. Susanna Herculana Hussel, she's an associate professor of the Department of Psychology and Biological Sciences at Vanderbilt University. Her TED Talk, What is so special about the human brain, has been seen almost 500,000 times on YouTube alone. She's also written many books, one of which is The Human Advantage. Friends, please enjoy. Susanna, welcome to the show. Thank you. My pleasure talking to you. It's a big pleasure, Herna. An honor having you on. I think we're going to have a, a really interesting conversation. So big thank you for taking the time to come on. Of course. Anytime. Um, I would like to start off with something I, I found uh, interesting. Um, I heard a rumor, Susanna, that you're that you're a brain smuggler, a brain smuggler on planes. Whoa, 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 whoa. I meant not smuggled <laughs> smuggle anything. It was all perfectly legal, done through the right <laughs> channels, proper channels with all the paperwork. But yes, it did start off with some very, very weird phone calls. Um, I, I had to, um, because exactly I wanted to do everything the proper way, I, I called ahead at the airport when I would be coming in and asked the lady at the in, in charge of the, the sanitary inspections at customs. Um, so, yeah. I, so I just introduced myself. Hello, I'm a researcher and I'll, I'll be visiting a collaborator in South Africa soon. And I want to know, I'd like to know if it's, if it would be okay for me to bring an elephant brain with me in my suitcase. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm expecting this lady to freak out on the other side of the phone. Because, you know, elephant brain. Um, but she she just goes in an elephant brain. And I'm like, yes. Is it alive? And I'm like, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Is it, that's, a, that's a good question. I, I Is know, it alive? Right, right. And uh, so I, I, uh, I just said, no, it's, uh, it's good and dead. It's uh, fixed in formaldehyde. And I'm bringing it in for research pur purposes. I'm bringing in just the brain, not the rest of the elephant. Um, and then she said, well, if it's fixed, if it's not a biological risk, then we don't care. So <laughs> right. I, I, that's what I learned much to my surprise in Brazil. If I wanted to bring, um, research tissue, so biological tissue that had been preserved in formaldehyde, if, as long as it didn't pose any biological threat and most important part, as long as it didn't have any commercial value then it was perfectly legal. So, but yeah, that, that gave me some very good stories at airports and customs, as you can imagine. How many times did you take uh, brains on, uh, on airplanes? Oh, several. Um, um, at one point when I was in the, the, the height of my brain collecting in different countries with my different collaborators that uh, my, my kids expected me to step off of the, of the plane bringing either, um, you know, like a, a little toiletry case or um, it, it escalated to the point where I, I once did arrive from South Africa with two suitcases full of brains. <laughs> okay. They they did yeah. love the part where they would go to school and because they attended the same school that I did when I was a, a kid. It's a small school and the, the, their teachers still knew me. 
um, they would go to school and say, just just comment nonchalantly, hey, my mom arrived home with a giraffe brain in her pack today. And, uh, you know, that their teachers would know it was perfectly true. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like if you, if it would have been some other kid, then the teacher would be like, mm, "Yeah, well, I don't know." But then, as they know, imagination, as... yes, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That is very interesting. Yeah, cool. Yeah, because because you have been doing some fascinating stuff about brain about brains, and you've also written a book about brains called The Human Advantage. Um, I think that perhaps if we could talk a little bit about brains and and perhaps the human brain in particular. Um, so, so what the human brain, what differ like the human brain from, from other brains? Um, well, if you ask me, I'm going to tell you that, um, the huge difference really is that we managed to increase the number of neurons. We managed to, to have, um, to have much more of what other primates have all the while still keeping up what I would call a perfectly um, normal primate brain. Um, and, and so if you ask other people, if you ask a lot of my colleagues, they're going to tell you, well, the human brain has this and that gene and all these very special mechanisms that change this and that. Um, and yeah, of course there are, a number of differences between humans and any other species, exactly like you will, you will always find a number of genes that differ between cats and dogs and between even dog breeds, because of course, if they look different, of course, there are biological differences um, between them. But I think in the long run, the now that we have looked at close to a hundred to brains of a hundred different species and humans are just one of them. The, 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 I think the pattern is very clear. There's the, the, the human brain is not an outlier in any way, actually, that we've looked at it so far in terms of what the brain is made of and its relationships to the size of the body and how much energy it uses and how many cells it has in different, uh, in different structures. Really the, the big thing about human brains, the one thing that sets us apart from everybody else is we have an, an, an enormous number of neurons in the cerebral cortex. It's on average 16 billion neurons in the cerebral cortex. And Next in line are gorillas with only about half as many. Even if really, so, so so we have the most of all species, and then gorillas are second. Gorillas are second. So we that elephant brain that uh, yes did end up turned into soup because that's how <laughs> um, how many cells different brains are made of. The even though the the elephant cortex is twice the size of a human cortex it only has one third as many neurons. So in that elephant brain, we found, in the cortex, we found not even 6 billion neurons. It was 5.6 billion neurons. So um, that goes to show that different, that brains are not all made the same way, meaning that uh, if you have two brains of the same size, they do not necessarily have similar numbers of neurons. You can have a smaller brain, like the human brain, have three times as many neurons as the a twice bigger uh, cortex, like the the elephant. But there are patterns, and primates have their pattern. And we humans, we are yet another primate, and we definitely follow that pattern. Very interesting, and I, I think perhaps that we could talk a little about a little bit about the cerebral cortex, since that is the thing that seems to be the special thing about about the human brain um so like what is the cerebral cortex and what does it do the the cerebral cortex is a part of the brain that um literally sits on top of everything else and that means that it is strictly not necessary for business so you you can you can carry on with most of your most fundamental behaviors, your body will still function if your cortex, if your cerebral cortex is not not working. Um, but of course, you lose all the rest, which 
shows us what the cerebral co cortex is about. So um, it, this is a structure that receives copies from everything else, from all the other structures in the brain. So it, uh, and because of that, and because it has so many internal connections that allow it to create new associations that didn't exist before or that and that couldn't exist otherwise, because it's really just the cortex in the brain that has the, the network that allows it to create new associations. Um, that adds a lot to behavior. And uh, I think the simplest way to put it, the way I like to put it is when you, when you have a cerebral cortex, your behavior gains in flexibility. In flexibility in the sense that um, you, while you will still be capable of simply responding to whatever it is that happens to you or that you see in the environment or that happens around you, you will first, you will be capable of responding in different ways because you will be able to use your past experience. Uh, you, you will be able to make projections for the future based on those past experiences, based on your own preferences. So you gain a past and you gain a future if you have a cerebral cortex. You're not just living in the present anymore. Inter inter interesting. So so perhaps could could you perhaps give like an example of something that would be typical for a species that has an, a, a bigger cerebral cortex and, and one that doesn't have a big cerebral cortex? Well, um, I can, I can give you an example state straight from, from home. Um, yeah. <laughs> every single time the, the doorbell rings on my TV, my dogs go crazy. They, they, they run for, they run to the door because they heard a doorbell ring. And if a doorbell rings, it's the doorbell, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. We, so they, they, they apparently can't put the two things together that in this context, when I'm sitting in that very particular place, the couch in front of the TV, and, <laughs> um, and they hear a doorbell, maybe it's not the real doorbell. Because guess what? Every single time they go there and there's nobody at the door. Um, <laughs> so they still yeah. haven't been able to, to, to learn that, to, to make that connection, to realize that there's an association between this context, doorbell ringing, really not, um, not nobody out there. Uh, and and that's that's just a, that's a, just a silly example, but it's the kind of thing that we do all the time without even noticing. I think we it, it becomes normal. We just take for granted that we that we do that. And I think the the reason why it becomes normal and, and we take it for granted is um, yet another advantage, let's say, of having all these neurons that we have in the cerebral cortex that allow, that give us as flexibility, they also give us time. I, I would say that, uh, so when you ask me what is the, the thing that separates humans from all the other species, um, I'd say it's, it's not that our brain is special, um, it's just that we are the species that managed in a number of ways to have that ridiculously large number of neurons in the cortex. But I would add to that now that uh, the most consequential thing about having tons of neurons is that you gain time. And time in a number of ways, but especially um, the more neurons, this is something that I, I, I uh, found and published just last year, the more neurons a warm-blooded species has in the cerebral cortex, the longer it takes to develop, to mature into adulthood, and also the longer it lives after that. So um, you, you probably heard uh, a number of discussions on how come human childhood is special. It's an evolutionary um, adaptation to learning or this and that and how grandmothers are a human invention. Well, um, you don't need to resort to anything special about that, not in how they, they came about. Um, he, this is, we can, we can, the math shows that, uh, a long childhood is exactly what you would expect of 
any warm-blooded animal, this includes birds, that has a large number of neurons in the cortex. And also, a longer life after that also comes naturally, automatically, with more neurons in the cortex, which means we not only get all these neurons that allow us, uh, that give us all the, the biological information processing capabilities, along with them, we gain the time to train the network. We gain extended, uh, we gain proportionately longer childhoods, um, which allow us to learn all these things that now as adults, we just take for granted. I think that's very fascinating. So it's kind of, it's like we have this strategy to invest and then to, um, to develop, uh, to develop and then to, yeah, to live longer kind of. Yeah. So you, you could think of it that you could definitely frame it that way, that it's a, that it's a strategy, that it's something that's been selected for. But the thing is, this is a pattern that we find to apply throughout 700 plus species that we've looked at and birds and mammals humans are just one more point on the curve we're nowhere diff we're different in no way from from everybody else that is warm-blooded so if um in biology when you see a pattern like that that applies throughout it's very unlikely that um this is something special or that had to be subject to, subjected to, select, to selection. It's probably not an adaptation. It's simply what it is. It's, it's how biology works. And sometimes it's just how physics works. For reasons that we have yet to understand, we don't know yet. I have a number of um, hypotheses and, and models for how come having more neurons in the cortex would give warm-blooded animals a longer life. But um, right now, these are all just theories. We need the data. We need the, the, we need the research. But still, the, the association is really strong. And it, uh, it's so strong that it implies that it is automatic. And being automatic it means that if you look back at human evolution, when human brains or... Well, or lineage, when, 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 when human-like brains started increasing in size about 2 million years ago, meaning when they started gaining neurons, we now know to expect that along with that, automatically came a, longer, a proportionately longer childhood and proportionately longer lives, which meant that now the, the, the new humans uh, with slightly more neurons in, the, in, their, in their cortex, they had more time to learn from their parents. And also when they became parents, they lived longer lives, which meant that they must have gained more time to overlap with their own young. And that's how you form a culture. You need right. time. Yeah. You need time. You need overlap. You, you need generational overlap. And that's something, turns out, that comes with more neurons in the cortex. And you also, I mean, and exactly, and you also need a more advanced brain, perhaps, to be able to learn and teach, right? Or well, it's all coming together, because whatever it is that gave you more neurons in the cortex, and that could be just pure chance, it could be just anything that uh, there's this, this much we know from all the work of my colleagues on uh, the many different genetic ways to make brains of different sizes or with different numbers of, of neurons. There are many, many changes that would make that occur spontaneously. Now, once that happens, the, you, it will come, this is, this is what the data show, it will come somehow, but it will come with um, longer childhood and a longer life. So the, the, you, you see, the, it's you can you can take you can take the facts, you can take the numbers, and spin any of, of a number of stories that you'd like. And some people would certainly like to start with the part of how it's more adapted to have more neurons because of the cognitive capabilities that they give you. Um, and I think that's that's 
probably correct and part of the story. But you could also take the same data and say, well, however this happens, you're going to have all of this together. You're going to have more processing capability, more time and more generational overlap. That's also true. Um, you could spin yet a third story saying, well, this is what's it's it's longevity. That's really the thing being selected for. So it's as you live longer that that in, uh, enables more that make that's what makes more neurons so advantageous because, well, if you're living longer, you're going to run into more things in your environment. You're going to need more neurons. Right. So it's to me, it's all interconnected and it it it. Um, I think recognizing that there are all these different aspects to the same story and all these different ways that you can look at the same data, I, I think that's that's part of the beauty of it. That's that's that just goes to show how intricate and complex the whole thing is, and yet how simple it is because it works beautifully. Yeah, for sure. All right. So, so one thing that seems to be quite remarkable about the human brain is that we have a really big cerebral cortex. We have 16 billion. And you said that the second biggest cerebral cortex was of the gorilla, which had eight. Right. Or Is that yeah. correct? Right. Yeah. Um, I think there's something else that also seems interesting uh, with the... Um, with the primate brain is that our neurons do not seem to increase in size when our brains increase in size, but rodents neurons seems to increase in size as they're, as they get more neurons. Is that correct? Or? Yeah. So that was, that was one of the, the surprises um, we ran into right at the beginning. The, the, the general expectation in neuroscience was that Bigger brains should be made of more neurons, well, of course, but they should also be made of bigger neurons. And one of the, the, the simple reasons to expect that is that, well, neurons are cells that connect distant parts of the, the tissue, distant parts of the brain, and even distant parts of the body. So the bigger a body is, the longer that one fiber of neurons that connects that neuron here to whatever is over there, over there is getting more distant. So that fiber at the very least is going to have to become longer. Um, which means that uh, the neuron, the average neuron as a whole should become bigger. Now, there's two really interesting things about that. The first is that, like you said, we found out that that was the case to different degrees in different types of animals. And in primates in particular, the average size of the neuron does not really increase. That means that, of course, some neurons become much bigger, the, the ones that really go the distance. But either they're becoming a smaller proportion uh, of all neurons, or um, there probably are also are other neurons that do become smaller, or you, you, you change the balance between local connectivity and long range connectivity. But the, the other thing that we finally realized was that, and this is interesting because I, I think it goes to show how distant the different sciences became from, from one another. If you ask neuroscientists about what happens to the size of the cells that they care about, neurons, they will tell you, yeah. well, yes, of course, the bigger an animal is, the bigger the, the bigger the brain is, and the bigger the neurons are, right? Seems perfectly intuitive. If you ask a biologist who has any kind of knowledge about any other part of the body of, or of, of the animal body, and if you ask them, well, should uh, should bigger brains be made of bigger neurons? They're just going to look at you like in complete lack of understanding and say, what? Why? 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 Why would you ever expect <laughs> Who are <that>? you? <laughs> Cells yeah. are the same size no matter where. A liver cell is the same size in a mouse and a giraffe, which, by the way, is something that we just verified um, ourselves because we had to we had to generate our own systematic body of data to really see if it's if it if it's the case that it's something that's special about neurons. Neurons are the type the cell type that is weird, let's say, in comparison to every to everything else. So that's the thing. 
it, it is true that a liver cell in a tiny little mouse liver or in a gigantic giraffe liver, they are the same size. Right. So how come neurons but, are different? That's the next question now. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that is something that I've been thinking about as well. I mean, as, as I understand that, like if, if a rodent's brain, if they get more neurons, then the size of each neuron also increase in yes. general. Um, but then, I mean, do they become better? And also, I mean, why? <laughs> so yeah, two questions. Right. So, so here's, here's the thing. And uh, to me, this is the, the, the big message that I take from all of this to, to the point that I'm preparing a, 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 a new book with this, this name. Um, I, I understand, of course, especially since Darwin and made uh, adaptation through natural selection seem so, well, natural and uh, inevitable. I understand that um, we, we all grew up thinking that whatever exists exists because it's better than the alternative, because it, it became adapted for this and that. It got selected for. What I've seen again and again and again with uh, in in the in the particular case of the brain, and I have um, no doubt that it applies to every other system as well, is that that's not true. Well, first, brains are not optimized for anything. Um, the biggest evidence is that there's no one single way to put a brain together. Rather, what you have is what I'd like to, to call whatever works. There, there are many different ways of putting a brain together. There's, there are many different ways of putting a brain in the body. If you can take a, a, an, an animal that weighs one kilogram and it can be a rodent, that weighs one kilogram, it can be a primate, it can be a bird that weighs one kilogram. Each of them will have a completely different number of neurons in their brain and in their cerebral cortex. And yes, you could start spinning all sorts of stories about how one is better for this and the other is better for that. But uh, and and for and for instance, how um, how come the rodent, the, the one kilogram rodent lives only one fifth, probably as long as the primate, which in turn lives only one fourth or one fifth as long as the, the bird with a similar body size. And you could, you could tell all sorts of stories about how that is a good thing, but I would just say, no, it, it's just um, they live different times because they have different numbers of neurons. They, they just ended up having that. And it's fine because it still works. And one is going to live two years, the other is going to live 10, and the other is going to live 50. But that's perfectly fine. It works for all of them. This is diversity for you. This is, this is how life works. And I, me, especially for me as a biologist, that to me is the real beauty of taking the systematic approach to, understand, to looking at bodies and brains and comparing them, you, you realize, or at least I've been realizing, that it's, you don't need the, to tell the story, to tell a story of how everything became the way it is because it became better or adapted or was selected for this and that. No. Variation will appear naturally simply because biology is biology. It's never 100% efficient. It's never 100% efficacious. There's always mistakes. And those mistakes are the what we call the mutations that make diversity, make variety arise spontaneously. And it turns out that biology is very kind in this way. There's multiple things there's multiple ways of of doing something that still work right that's interesting so there's many different ways of creating a brain then um right you you mentioned that so the the, the size of the cortex can be different between species but is it mostly i mean is that the part of the brain that usually differs the most or i mean does the rest of the brain contain amount i mean 
does the rest of the brain contain sim- similar amount of neurons and it's the cerebral cortex that differ usually or uh, the cerebral cortex is not the only part of the brain that varies this much the cerebral cortex is the part of the brain that I've, i keep talking about because it really is i think the part of the brain that gives you most directly that added flexibility and complexity to your behavior the more neurons it's made of that's that's my logic that's the way i see it that the more because the cortex is this part that creates new associations and receives a copy of everything and and puts it all together the more neurons you have available to do that the more capable you are of flexible and complex behavior. The rest of the brain, all the other structures of the brain, they of course have really important functions um, that uh, also should depend on how many neurons they have, but maybe to a lesser degree than the cortex. But yes, to answer your question, they're also variable across uh, different types of animals. So there's not one single way to put a cerebellum together. There's not a single way to put a hindbrain together. Different types of animals do have their different, their own different relationships between the size of these structures and how many neurons they have. And even um, across numbers of neurons in the different parts of the, of the brain. The, so there's a lot of diversity there too. It's not just the cortex. Right, that's that's so interesting. But then, is it is it how is it how the brain comes together that are different, or is it also the function of that part of the brain that differs? The it's um, I I would say um, especially if you're comparing just mammals, if you're comp- or even if you're comparing um, warm vertebrates as a whole, so birds and mammals. The the connectivity, the pattern of connectivity, so how all the parts are interconnected and um, their own circuitry, that is very similar, very, very, very similar to the point that um, we've learned that you can you can use one animal like a, a mouse or even a chicken to study the circuitry because it's, of course, much easier to um, to identify the parts of the circuits and how everything is connected in a small system, in a small network, a small brain than in a large one. So that's that's a, that's a very common and very fruitful approach. If you want to understand how the human brain is connected, you don't need to start with the human brain. You can start with a mouse brain, understand how its parts are connected. And now that you know what you're looking for, now you can move on to the Sorry, I have white. Oh, Jesus, it's my phone. Yeah. Did, no you, did you hear my phone <laughs> no. ringing? Yeah, a little bit, but not oh, so okay. much. Okay, so you're only getting the, the sound. I'm sorry, I forgot, to, I forgot to mute my phone. Let me do that. Yeah, no worries. No okay, worries. there. Um, where was I? These uh, vertebrate brains are so similar that it turns out that you don't have to start with a, a human brain if you want to understand how the human brain is connected. You can start with a mouse brain that is much smaller, it's much simpler to um, analyze, it's made of fewer parts. And you find out that uh, once, you, once you've mapped the circuitry there and now you move to the human with that prior knowledge, you find everything there in the human. It's very similar. So the the, the circuitry, the pattern of circuitry is very much the same um, to the point that like I said, you can you can use one animal as a proxy to study the circuitry of the other, and you find out in the end that uh, it works fine. The main difference is really in how many units each each of these circuits is made of. Okay, so so that is the big difference. Like how many, yeah, how many how many neurons that that are in these different circuits or. Yeah, so you can, just to give you an idea, you can, we have multiple atlases of neuroanatomy in, in different animals. So these are books, big reference books that show you the different parts of the brain. And now more and more, they also show the main paths of connectivity across different structures, right? And you can use, you can look at a chicken brain atlas and a mouse and a pigeon and a 
monkey um, and a human brain atlas. And you're going to find the same structures again and again and again. That means that at least qualitatively, the brain develops very much in the same way. I think the, 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 in, well, this of course is my bias. This is what I look at professionally. The, but I, I think that the main source of diversity in this aspect, when you're comparing different, uh, when you're asking how come the different species, how, how, how are all of them possible? Um, I think the diversity lies most of all in quantitative variation. So it's right. not, do you have this structure? It's how much of this structure do you have? How much of the neurons that build this structure do you have? Right. And when it comes to, to us then, that we have a lot of neurons in our cerebral cortex, for example. Oh, so many. Oh, so <laughs> many. And, uh, right. and of course, you can, you can then ask, how come we ended up affording this many neurons that nobody else um, does, which I yeah. think is a fascinating uh, part of the, uh, the story. And necessarily, it's, it's one that involves storytelling and some fiction and creativity, but still grounded on data that we have. On the other part of how, what do we know that will automatically vary now that you have more neurons in the cerebral cortex right so perhaps we can take that story then like how come we have such a big cerebral cortex cortex and such a big brain so um my my version of the the, the story the version that i find most uh well the simplest and also the the, the most likely is that um up to two million years ago the what what existed was well uh, a group of primates that had some variation in size. Um, mind you, the small primates, the smallest ones, never went away. They still exist. We have marmosets. They're tiny little primates, which goes to show that brains do not have to get bigger. Bodies do not have to be, to, to to become bigger. Tiny animals work just as well. But anyway. Up to two million years ago, you, you saw some increase in the range of variation of brain size um, up to a point where the, the smallest brains were still there. The biggest ones were about the size of something between what you have today in a chimpanzee or a gorilla. The, so that variation precedes us. Um, it, uh, the... Now, what's, what seems to have happened is that in one group of primates that already had that biggish brain with a biggish number of cortical neurons, something of between uh, six, seven, or eight billion, like I said, between a chimpanzee and a, and a gorilla, um, other things changed as well. In the, in the body of these animals, they, some of them stood upright, so their skeleton changed. They, uh, they became habitual bipedals, meaning they, they, these creatures now that they stood up, they would walk on only the hind legs. Now, that is a big thing that, again, we take for granted because that's how we've been doing this for two million years. But... Walking on two legs is a big thing when you've been walking on fours because that means that now you can use half the energy to go the same distance, which also means that you can use the same amount of energy that you had available to go twice the distance, which means that now you and nobody else, you have access to more food. All, all else remaining equal you can go twice the distance. You can get twice the amount of food. You can eat twice as much. So you can get twice the number of calories. And by our accounts, when, uh, when you have, when a, a, an animal, especially a primate with all the neurons in its cortex, when, um, when a primate becomes that big, uh, so chimpanzee size with that number of neurons, it's very, very close to the edge. It's living very close to um, the, the limit of its resources, of how much energy it can get and therefore how much it can grow. 
Now, uh, so now you have an animal that has that number of neurons, but all of a sudden it just gained the ability to go twice the distance, get twice the energy, and therefore now it can afford more neurons or more body or a little bit of both even. Also, now that it's bipedal, you have your hands free, which means that uh, you can um, you can make much better use of your hands. You can also carry things the, the distance. So between four and two million years ago, what we have is a period of evolution where this there are uh, one group of uh, a new form, let's say, of primate life appeared that had all of these anatomical changes that allowed for more energy to feed more neurons. And I, I the way I, I like to see it, um, it it all came together and reached an exponential point somewhere between one million and a million and a half years ago when you put all of that together plus now an already increasing number of neurons, which, like I said, will automatically, I believe, bring you more uh, cognitive capability. And remember, that also comes with more time. So you have more cog you have more capability, information processing capabilities, you have more time to learn your environment and to learn the tricks of your parents and your your family before you. So that gives rise to technology, which if you think of it is yet something yet another way in which our neurons give us time. Because technology is any process of or object or a system that allows you to solve the same problem faster, meaning you now have free, free time to do something else, even to look for more complicated problems. And so I think that all comes together and just snowballs into this process about a, a million and a half years ago, where the more neurons you have in the cortex, the more time that then in, in cognitive uh, information processing capabilities that they give you, and through more time, the more you can turn those capabilities into actual abilities and pass them on and gain more energy and cook, which, in, by the way, is a technology that frees up an enormous amount of time. Um, and again, that's something else that we've become so used to because we grow up with it. We spend so much time not having to waste time out there looking for food and eating raw foods that we just take it for granted. But it's cooking is also a technology that frees up time and that I think had it's another technology that had an enormous um, role in that upward exponential increase of numbers of neurons in humans and humans alone. Okay, this, I think this is super fascinating. So what you're saying is that first we stood up, we started walking on two legs, and that is something that helped us to get more energy. And yes. because we got more energy, we could invest that energy in, in technology, in our brain, and also in our body. Um, and then what you're saying is that we also came up with the technology of cooking. So basically, I mean, doing stuff to our food so that we will get more energy out of our food. So putting it over a fire or perhaps cutting it into pieces. Um, perhaps we could go even deeper into that. So like, how did cooking affect the, how did, it, how did, it, how did the technology of cooking affect the size of the brain, of our brain? Um, so something we don't realize um, is, again, because we by now leave, live these very jaded, technology-full lives, is that um, food for an animal is something that you have to destroy with your teeth. It's, it's another form of life that you have to find. You have to capture it or unearth it, literally. And then you have to put it in your mouth and you have to destroy it with your teeth. And that's the only way that food, that other life can now become assimilated and become part of your body. 
that's that's my very <laughs> that's my very crude um, gore goreish uh, gory biological. It's very good. Of, I think it's very good at pedagogical. Of how yeah. we eat. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's, but that's that's what that's what food is. It's something that you have to put in, <laughs> into your mouth and destroy with your teeth, and that's where cooking comes in because cooking is, in my definition, is any kind of food pre-processing that happens before you put it in your mouth. Um, so crushing is a form of cooking. Cutting is a form of cooking. It's what I call cold cooking. Um, and in that sense, these are things that other animals also do. You have several primates that crush nuts, that use stones as tools to crush nuts and before they put that in their, in their mouths. Um, crows are known to drop nuts from the sky also so they 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 hit the ground and splatter and then they come pick up the pieces that is cooking that is cold cooking that meaning that is pre-processing your food and what's so important about pre-processing your food in one way or another and for humans it started with stone tools is that again you're freeing up time you're you're pre-processing makes your uh body-based eating faster because, well, now that the, the food that you have cut or sliced or minced or heated up or dissolved in acid um, when you marinate it, so cooked in any way, once that food enters your mouth, it's by definition softer which means that it's going to take you much eff uh, much less effort and also much less time to grind that food to a pulp in your mouth that you can finally swallow. This is this is a, a fun bit of trivia that most people haven't realized. Um, the thing about chewing that your mother and your grandmother told you chew before you before you swallow, it's not optional. <laughs> uh, you have to your, your, yeah. your, your brain only accepts to swallow something once it's soft enough in your mouth and once it's even most important wet enough True. and the only way to make something wet enough in your mouth is to chew and chew and chew because as you chew you're producing saliva water and that's what uh, allows you to eventually swallow so um, if, if, if the food enters your mouth already preheated, pre-softened, and most likely wet already from the, the process of cooking, you're going to have a much easier time chewing it, and it's going to be much easier and faster till you're finally able to swallow it. And then the, the, the whole thing keeps happening um, once the food hits your stomach because once food is um, turned into, into mush, the more complete that mush is, rather than, say, having the, the little pieces of, uh, that are left from a, a raw carrot that you, you, you chew just enough that you can, you can swallow it. When food is completely processed, when it completely turned into a pulp, every last bit of it is exposed to digestive enzymes in your stomach, in your digestive tract. Every last bit is broken down and can be absorbed once it gets to your intestines. So the caloric yield and the nutrient yield of cooked foods is much, much bigger than that of any raw foods. And here's where people still have a misconception because in the, the 80s and 90s, we grew up hearing about uh, how you should eat your veggies raw. And uh, well, that's, that's only because the alternative then was used to be boiling everything. And when you boil Boiling is a very particular type of cooking because when you boil, you're effectively washing away the nutrients. You throw them away in the water. 
that's very different from, say, cooking in a stew or cooking in an oven or just heating over fire where you keep everything. All the nutrients are there and they've also just become their absorption has has just become much more efficient and much more likely simply because they were they were cooked. So right. there are there are several estimates of what you gain with uh cold cooking or hot cooking uh, of food. And you, it's one way or another, that's the only way you can come up to 100% efficiency, to 100% yield right. of the, the calories in the food that you eat. But what, what, what also must have happened is that we could eat stuff that we couldn't eat before. I'm thinking about perhaps, I mean, tube, tubers, for example, must have been easier, a lot easier to eat once they've been cooked compared to, you know, taking out a tuber from the ground and like oh, eating it. Exactly. And, and that, that is also, that's also where technology steps in in many different forms. So yes, you're absolutely right. Things that you hadn't realized before that are edible, you now learn to eat them. Like you cook your tubers, you cook carrots, you, you, cook, you cook potatoes and now you can, now you can eat them. Yeah. Um, you also realize because you have this growing number of neurons to, to make new associations, to make the connections, you also realize that, for instance, some really hard and bitter fruit that you, when you put them in your mouth, they taste like rocks. It's like chewing on stones. You realize that once they happen to fall into salt water, they 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 soak and they they uh, swell and they become delicious. I'm talking about olives. Whoever yeah. has tried to get an olive raw from an olive tree, Jesus, those things are stones and they're <laughs> bitter. It's, I, I I I've looked at them in wonder, just thinking, whoever would think that this could be a good idea? Yeah. But uh, you know, once you see it falling into into ocean water, and you realize you're curious, and you just pick it up and you try it, then you put two and two together, and you start making that happen on purpose. And that's the kind of thing that happens more easily and more often the more neurons you have in your cerebral cortex. So you see how everything comes together, and one thing just feeds into the other. And that's why, to me, this is the simplest explanation for how come our species and our species alone um, gained so many neurons in the cortex in so in such a, a short time in evolutionary terms, just two million years. I, I think that is so, so interesting because, like, let's say that you're a species and and you have like a really big brain and really big body. Then as fast as you, like when, when hard times come and you don't get energy, then you die, right? So, I mean, it's, it's a big liability as well to have a big brain and have a big body. Well, um, yes and no, because see, the, the bigger body, the body you have, the more reserves you have. The one thing that you absolutely need um, over short periods of time is water. Yeah. Not food. So if you compare an elephant and a, a little shrew, and just put them in a place where there's little energy available, but they still have water, it's the elephant that's going to fare better. Right. Not the shrew. Yeah, that, yeah that's true. Um, but what what I find interesting about like the, the cooking part and the, the standing up becoming bipedal is that, it's, it, as you said, it seems to really... I mean, you... You stand up, you can get some more energy, and then perhaps you can get a little bit of a bigger cortex, and then you find some, you invent some technology, and you start can start to cook some food, and perhaps that yields another, like a little bit more energy, and then then you get a little bit smarter, and then you get a little bit more food, and then it seems like this upward spiral right. that that in the end just just made us quite smart compared to other species. Yeah, I, I I think so. And uh, and and remember that an enormous part of how smart we are is learned is is something that only happens because we have typically between thirteen and eighteen years to learn everything that we need 
to live independently from our parents. And after that, we function on our own, but we're still learning. We're still becoming smarter in the sense of still figuring out how to do more things in a more complex, flexible way and and faster. So um, I think that's that's something that comes with time. And yeah. that is which like I said, comes with getting more more neurons in the cortex. But I think it's a part of the story that we have yet to learn to separate from the, let's say, the pure biology, the pure bio, purely biological part of the story when we're comparing a mouse to a human. It's a very unfair comparison, not only because we have 1,000 times as many neurons as they do in the cerebral cortex, but also because we live 50 to 100 times longer than they do. Right. And but think, it, of all, think of all the, an adult mouse is one year old. Think of how capable you were when you were one year old. <laughs> yeah, true. But, but isn't it also that we as humans, that we also, that it's time plus the capabilities of learning and improving and everything. Well, or... of course, but those, you, can, you, can, you can also argue that those capabilities are only there because of time. So, so see, I, that's how to me it all boils down to what you gain by having by affording more neurons in the cerebral cortex. Note, you don't need more neurons in the cerebral cortex. Nobody does. Mice are still doing perfectly fine. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, and like I said, at by at, by hell, not even one year of age, by by two months of age, they're scurrying around and fending for themselves. Can you say that for when you were two months old? Uh, yeah, not really, no. Definitely not, definitely not. So that, like, that's that's yet another point where I say it's whatever works. That works perfectly fine. If you have few neurons, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna have limited capabilities, but so what? Your life is very short. Your environment is going to be very, very small, very limited. You do fine. Um, and as you gain more neurons, your, your capabilities, your range of possibilities expand in both space and time. And it all comes together. You get more of the, uh, the, the thing that's gaining you more time and, and, uh, and a, a wider spatial range is the same thing that also gives you more processing capabilities. So you're fine. I think the one question that is left in the end is how much do you have the opportunity and you choose to do with what you have? And that, I think, is where um, comes in a very important part that we take for granted, that is how we go beyond our pure uh, biological capabilities. That's why I, 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 I always take the care to um, make the distinction between what your biological capabilities are, which is what your amongst other things, your number of cortical neurons buys you and what your abilities are. Right. And there's, there's a big gap between having biological capabilities and turning them into abilities and the turning them into abilities part is where learning comes in and technology and science and education and overlapping with those who came before us and then doing our part when it comes our time to be the ones who are have become the repositories of knowledge and know-how and um it's our turn to pass it on to the next generation for sure uh, Susanna, do we have a little bit more time uh, or when, when do you have to get off, do you think? Uh, yeah, I still have a few, let's say 10 more minutes. <laughs> yeah, because it would be very cool also to get in a little bit, to, a, a little bit about energy as well, because I have some questions about that as well. Sure. Uh, yeah, let's, let's do that a little bit and then, then, we, then, then we'll close off. Um, okay, yeah, so that's interesting. Um, I would also like to, to ask you a little bit before we head off about energy consumption and the brain. Because um, it's said that we that our brain used that it, that our brain is two percent of our total body, but it consumes like twenty five percent of all the energy. Um, is that twenty five percent? Is that the amount of calories without doing anything else, just you know, to maintain the brain or? Um, 
that is the amount of calories in an active day where you presumably use about 2,000 kilocalories in a day. So 500 will be used by your brain alone. So if you're staying put, if you're not doing much, your brain will still use just as much energy. And proportionally to the body, that's going to ramp up to a third, maybe even half all the energy that your body uses. Okay, so just, just so, so, so I see uh, if I understand it. So if you're just laying in your bed the entire day, how much energy are your brain using then, like in percentage? Still exactly as much as you used uh, when you were out there running or when you were doing math. Um, so here's here's something. This is something that we've we're, we're learning right now. The brain seems to be working at capacity all the time. Really? Yes. Okay. That's that's completely different from your muscles. Your muscles are just sitting there in they have the potential to work. Um but they're not using all that energy right now. And that has to do with blood flow. The the amount of blood that flows through your muscles changes dramatically over time, depending on what you're doing, depending on how active your muscles are, right? right? As soon as you stand up and you start running, your muscles will get more blood simply because they've become more active. That's not true for your brain. Your brain is always, no matter what, um, using, having the same amount of blood pass through and it's always using pretty much the same amount of energy that sounds so interesting and so counterintuitive i mean i would i would imagine that if you're playing chess or something and you're a world champion that 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 activity would make your you use a lot more calories than perhaps laying in the sofa and you know relaxing and not thinking so about something it it doesn't and uh that's that's all the more evidence that your brain is really already working at capacity. It was at, at capacity already before you started playing chess. And the reason why you can play chess or uh, at that moment is exactly because once you start or start playing chess, you stop doing any, everything else. So that amount of energy used if for the brain as a whole, it stays the same, but now it's diverted, it's, it's concentrated on those parts of the brain that you're using to solve problems right there and then. That, that is so interesting also when I'm thinking about being like in a flow state and being in the zone, so to speak. I mean, you're I mean, very good at doing what you're doing right now, exactly because it's at the expense of all the other things that you've stopped doing. Exactly, exactly. That really makes sense that you have this, you have like 100% of, of capacity. And if you're doing something that is quite hard and quite advanced, then you have to use all your resources on that task almost. And, and I mean, not so much on, on other things. That really makes sense then. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, it does. It does. And I, I think it's a, this is how I like to think of how our brain works. So, um, interesting bit of trivia the, what, got started, <laughs> Go what got me started doing all this work that i do on on sizes and diversity and and evolution was um realizing that when i worked at a science museum years ago that um this was in brazil and i i realized that 60 60 percent of college educated people that i surveyed believed that they only used 10% of their brain, which is so wrong. In so many ways, <laughs> we use 100% of the brain all the time. Yeah. It's just yeah. We, use it, we use it in different ways. But one of the, the possibilities was, well, people will say, well, we use 10% of our capacity. And it's like, well, you can only say that if you know what 100% capacity is, like is in intellectual capacity. Do we know that? Thankfully, I don't think so. We can always learn more. Um, you could say we only use 10% of the mass of the brain. Not true. Um, we use the whole brain all the time. You could 
say that, well, if, uh, if it's true that the human brain is, has 100 billion neurons and 10 times as many other cells, which is what textbooks used to say then, then you could squint and do some poor math and come up with, well, then I guess this means that neurons are only about 10% of the brain cells. And maybe that's what we're using. We only use 10% of the brain cells. Which is still not true, uh, <laughs> because first, all your glial cells are working all the time, thank you. And also, as we um, came to, to, to learn, the, the human brain, like any other primate brain, is 50% neurons. There's, there's only about one glial cell to every, uh, there's only one new, there's only one cell that's not a neuron to every neuron on average in the, the entire human brain, which is yet another way in which we're just like any other primate. There's <laughs> nothing special about us. Very interesting. Um, Susanna, before we head off, could you just tell us the name of your old book and also, perhaps if you want to, the name of your new book and when it comes out and also where people can find you? Um, my, so the, the book that I have published in English is called The Human Advantage and it tells that story of how different brains are made and there's a lot of juicy stories on bringing brains through customs yes and uh, <laughs> on yeah. the human brain and what it how it compares to elephant brain and how it came to be the um the i'm what i'm working on right now is a new take on evolution that's based on this idea really that diversity is genius and we should really be celebrating di diversity not focusing on how to get rid of it and uh, that's based on the idea that biology is really about whatever works um, and if you'd like to know more about the work that we've been doing I keep a website that's called uh, Susanna Herculano Huzel.com slash lab and um we everything that we published and is there and also a blog that i keep in english now very cool susanna big big thank you for coming on and thank you for all the work that you're doing i think all of us has become a lot smarter and we have really really learned a lot so big big thank you for for coming on my pleasure thank you so much and i hope you never look at your kitchen the same way again i will never do that <laughs> <laughs> take care you too bye bye, bye. hope you enjoyed the episode. Friends, I really need your help. I'm trying to get the podcast out there. So I was wondering if you could help me by leaving a positive rating and a review on your Apple device or the podcast player that you're using, as well as subscribing to the podcast. That really helps getting the show more visible on iTunes and other players. And if you don't know how it's done, then YouTube has a lot of great videos, so you can search there. All right, that's it. Take care. <laughs>